because I'm curious to hear from you about your evolution as a trainer, because if I remember correctly, uh, animal training and animal behavior is not your full-time job. Is that correct? That's correct. So my full-time or my regular um, job or where I get mo spend most of my time and most of my income comes in is um, an instructional design. So that is creating learning, um, structured learning for people in corporate environments. Um, so the it's very similar in a lot of ways to training animals is that you're looking to make behavior change um, using concepts of science. And so what was the evolution to becoming a trainer? Did you own a particular dog or did you run into some dogs that uh, made you want to learn more? Yeah, so um, like a lot of trainers, I didn't um, start as a child saying I want to be an animal trainer. At some point in time, I adopted a, a dog. So that was um, when I bought a home in Oakland and finally had a yard. Um, so I was able to, to give a, a dog a home rather than um, living in an, uh, an apartment in San Francisco where we were restricted from having a, an animal. Um, even though many animals thrive still in, a, in apartment settings, we didn't have uh, a landlord who would permit it. So once we bought a home in Oakland, we adopted a, um, a male golden retriever who was about six years old. And about a year and a half um, into caring for him, he got a three-year vaccine um, for rabies and then um, shortly thereafter had a vaccine reaction and developed human-directed aggression. So um, worked through um, a lot of those challenges using some of the, the tools that I still use. Um, so behavior adjustment training, which we often call BAT, and um, look at that, which we often call LAT. Um, about a year, about that same time, um, when he was developing human-directed um, aggression to mostly to strangers, um, we also adopted a um, very fearful dog. And I, um, there was some suggestions that were given to us from the rescue, um, which were akin to just which were essentially flooding her. Um, so flooding is presenting the animal with um, the fear eliciting stimulus, which for her was the world at full strength. So it was just sort of throwing her into the deep end. Um, very quickly discovered that that was not a good idea. Um, and then started looking at the literature. Um, so there were some really helpful books that were out there. And then I said, huh, I know this stuff already. I studied this in my undergrad and graduate studies in psychology <laughs> um, because the, the degree that often ends up in instructional design and education is, is a degree in psychology. I, in particular, have um, a master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology. Um, so we cer certainly had learned the foundations of operant conditioning, um, had learned the foundations of classical conditioning and those pieces as I was reading through the literature on how to help really fearful dogs. It was essentially the same things that we would do with humans who experience um, large amounts of fear and anxiety and stress as a result to exposure to things that they are afraid of, like panic disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, and other general anxiety disorders. So the treatment actually looks very similar um, between among dogs and humans, except for we're not <clears throat> in, in humans, we're often hitting the um, cognitive component. And in dogs, um, we're really sticking in many cases to a classical um, association that this fearful trigger at a distance or at a strength that the, that the animal can handle predicts really great stuff. 
like food or toys or whatever is um, whatever makes that dog happy when it's relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very similar protocol to um, the one in humans, um, which is called exposure response prevention or ERP. So the process steps are very similar. And then once I found that, I was like, oh, um, around that same time. So we, I was still working um, uh, in, in a corporate office. Um, and then I decided to go out consulting. Um, and so then I had a little bit more time, the time that I was spending commuting back and forth between the office. And I said, well, I have this knowledge now from these dogs. Um, and maybe I can go into a shelter. And so that's when it began. So I um, then started volunteering at a local SPCA and very quickly um, started um, volunteering with behavior modification dogs and then um, <clears throat> heard about and went to a bunch of seminars and then went to the Karen Pryor Academy um, and <clears throat> and so it began. <laughs> you actually mentioned operant and I think classical conditioning, which if I'm somebody who doesn't know anything about animal behavior and I need a trainer to help me with my dog, are there certain uh, terms or phrases I should look for on uh, maybe the trainers I'm considering hiring? to make sure they have an understanding of sort of science-based behavior change? Yeah, so some of the key terms, one of the, one of the key terms in operant conditioning, so operant conditioning was developed by B.F. Skinner. So probably most of us probably have a little bit of a fuzzy memory of learning about B.F. Skinner when we were in high school or college psychology. Um, so that Psych 101 class covers Skinner and Pavlov. Um, so operant conditioning means that when an, when an organism, animal, human, whatever, operates on the environment and consequences come. So I work, I get paid. So that is me operating on my environment in order to gain a consequence. All animals do that. Um, so in that condition of I work, I get paid, that's something that I want. That is called positive reinforcement. So teaching animals to behave in particular ways. So when in a work situation, there are some behaviors that will help get me paid and some behaviors that won't. The behaviors that get me paid are the ones that I do more often. So um, when looking for a trainer, um, wanna find one who will teach you how to teach your animals which behaviors get paid. So when we talk in animal training about payment, often that means food. Food, affection, toys, anything that the animal finds is appetitive. And by appetitive, I mean that something that they will work for, that feels good to them, that tastes good to them, and that will result in that particular behavior increasing. Just as in the workplace, um, we no longer allow people to be um, hit or spanked in terms of like children in schools um, because there is a lot of fallout that happens with the with using those methods um, so for humans it would be increased anxiety you may seem see some aggression um, your boss hits you maybe you want to hit him back um, so then we, in order to avoid that sort of workplace violence, we ignore the behavior or we um, say, don't do that, do this instead, and really focus on the do this instead behavior. Um, and maybe don't focus so much on the behavior that we don't want, we develop the behavior that we do want. Similar with our animals. If we use punishment, um, then we get that fear, anxiety, and potentially aggression. So same, same um, rules apply because the, the, those principles that Skinner discovered in his lab apply universally. They're generally referred to as laws of learning. Um, so we're, we are, we wanna look for a trainer who will focus on um, the positive as opposed to 
that what we may refer to as old school um, training, which relies on punishment. So um, focusing on that positive reinforcement and minimizing the punishment and the, um, the use of any sort of aversive tools would be one of the first things that I would look for in, um, in assessing whether a trainer um, is going to be appropriate for, for me um, in working with, with any animal, whether it be a rabbit or a dog or um, my pet squirrel. Not that I'm necessarily advocating pet squirrel. <laughs> in your work or evolution of, as a trainer, do you have any sort of passion projects that you're currently working on? Yes, so the, my current passion project is I'm actually in the shelter world. Um, so I mentioned earlier that one of the, my entry or my gateway drug to um, training with both private clients was through the shelter. And I still keep uh, a foot or two um, in the shelter world. Um, I have been a behavior and training consultant for a large local admission um, shelter in the area, and I'm just starting up a nonprofit that is focused on um, training volunteers and staff how to do enrichment, including including inner dog play. So um, enrichment is a really key piece of keeping our shelter dogs sane while they're in the shelter environment. Um, so enrichment includes providing puzzle toys, providing training, um, human animal interactions. So even just sitting on the floor and reading a book along with a dog is considered an enrichment activity. Um, all the way up to introducing dogs together so that they can have playtime. Now that, um, as you might imagine, may, um, play, managing play, and doing dog-dog introductions is sort of an, it's not sort of an advanced skill, it is an advanced skill. So you need to have a really good, solid understanding of dog body language, of inter-dog play signals, what um, potential uh, aggression looks like, differentiate aggression from play, because some of those behaviors, like a play growl, um, to somebody who doesn't know the difference may be a little scary. So the nonprofit that I started, which is called the Shelter Playgroup Alliance, um, focuses on developing educational materials for shelters and then teaching um, shelters, including their staff and volunteers, how to manage good dog play. Uh, and I know a lot of shelter staff and volunteers sometimes are just sort of overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have? Have they been receptive to this behavior information that you're passing on to them? Yes, so um, we have tested this in seven shelters so far, six in the Denver area and one in the um, Marin area. And um, the reception has been super positive. <clears throat> I think I, um, I was recently at a conference with a lot of other shelter professionals and they were very excited about our program. Um, there is one other program that, that does the sort of thing that we're um, talking about, interdog play, um, but that other program doesn't have as much emphasis on education and other forms of enrichment. And what I heard from the shelter community is that it's those other wraparound pieces of good, solid educational experience for volunteers and staff, and then how to do other enrichment um, activities for those shelter animals who maybe don't um, want to play with other dogs and or don't have the skills to engage in good, healthy play. And if someone is interested in finding out more information about the Shelter Play Group Alliance, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, do you have a website up and running already or? We do, it's shelterdogplay.org. So that's shelterdogplay.org or you can Google um, Shelter Play Group Alliance. And will you be doing largely 
remote consults with the shelters or the goal is to go to the shelters and work in person? How is that going to work? Yeah, so it's a combination of whatever that shelter needs. So um, for shelters who have robust behavior departments, they can take our materials with a little bit of guidance and implement them on their own. So somebody who is a certified professional trainer, who is a KPA grad, um, they'd be able to take our educational materials and implement them in, their, in the shelter with very little um, intervention on our part. There are a lot of shelters who do not have um, robust behavior departments. So in those instances, we would um, go to that shelter, probably conduct a series of, of workshops with their, um, with their volunteers and staff, and then help them get an enrichment program in place if they don't already have one. And then um, also add interdog play to their enrichment program. Part of the reason why we started that was demand from shelters for an, all, uh, an additional play group method that includes um, a lot of positive reinforcement, training the dogs for life skills at home, um, adding a, a robust enrichment program rather than using us play as the single enrichment strategy and more robust educational materials. So when I was at conferences and um, visiting shelters, um, shelter folks usually when they go to a new city, they usually find a shelter person and then ask to visit. So I've gone to lots of shelters um, over the years and visited and talked to other shelter, um, other shelter folks that were really um, hungry for the, the type of program that we've developed. So it wasn't necessarily that I thought that this was the best thing to put out there. It was really a response to other folks saying, hey, we wish that there was something in addition to the, the, the playgroup program that is already available. Um, we tried that, it sort of didn't work for us. Um, we wish that there were something a little bit um, more robust and um, and grounded in positive reinforcement and um, an and ethical standard, which we call LIMA, the least intrusive, minimally aversive ethical standard, which um, most certifying bodies require their certificates to sign uh, an attestation that they will adhere to that standard. Um, so a LIMA-based playgroup standard. So then said, okay, we could do it. So we, we are, and we're going to be launching it fully in um, May 2019. In your development as an animal behavior consultant or animal trainer, have you had any sort of mentors who have helped to guide you along your path? Yeah, I've had lots of mentors. Um, so one of my primary mentors was actually my Karen Pryor Academy um, instructor, and that is Nan Arthur. Um, so she has been really instrumental in um, helping me develop skill. Um, there's some, some other local folks um, in sheltering, um, a friend and somebody who has been in sheltering for a long time, Shane Stannis. Um, has been a mentor. Um, and then there are lots of folks that I look to and um, periodically ping for advice. Um, Susan Friedman, Ken Ramirez um, are among them um, that kind of when I am struggling with something that I can go to them. Um, so either clarifying a concept um, so those those folks have been really instrumental in um, me developing as as a trainer and um, and really understanding behavior well. Ah, and on the flip side, if uh, I'm somebody who maybe just adopted a dog from a shelter or brought a new puppy into the home, are there any sort of basic level behavior books that you sometimes recommend people pick up so they can have a better understanding of what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there's actually a book, it's called Love Has No Age Limit by Patricia McConnell. And that is a really great, it's a thin read. 
Um, and if you have just adopted an animal from a shelter or rescue, gives you some really good advice about um, what to do in those first couple of weeks when that animal has come home, they're decompressing from the shelter or they're adjusting from their foster home from a rescue and integrating them into your home. Uh, and actually that brings up another point. Will your NGO be providing, even if it's just online, behavior information for caregivers? Um, that particular nonprofit does not. So the Shelter Playgroup Alliance is on, almost entirely focused on um, assisting shelters, providing technical assistance for enrichment and shelters. But I do have a different nonprofit called Humane Dog Training Advocates, which is entirely owner focused. So the, my acronym for that is HDTA. So I'll refer to it as HDTA. But if you want to um, look at our website, it is Humane, H-U-M-A-N-E, Dog Training, D-O-G-T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G, Advocates, A-D-V-O-C-A-T-E-S.com. So Humane Dog Training Advocates.com. Um, that is quite a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I'll send you a QR code or send you a link to the link to that. Um, or somebody can Google it. But those have that website um, was born out of a discussion among some of our local trainers here in Oakland um, for a need for some owner education. Um, and among the handouts that we developed are choosing a dog professional. So that includes choosing a trainer, choosing a dog walker, choosing a daycare facility. Um, so we have what good looks like and some questions that owners can ask. We also have a um, sort of politically motivated alt facts um, handout, which talk about some of the myths that we often hear about um, our relationship with animals or how dogs learn um, and some of the some methods to use with them and then we suss out what is um, true of that statement and what is the actual fact of that statement because we hear lots of things some of the information is competing so we just tell you what the what the truth is um, we also have if anybody's interested in selecting a rescue um, they do, have not yet adopted a dog or are interested in adding a, another dog. We have selecting uh, a rescue as um, one of our handouts as well. So we have a owner directed materials and then also a full list of um, the of our top books that we believe are are good for owners to look at that are categorized um, by uh, type. So. If you just got a puppy, then there's a puppy section of some puppy-oriented books um, for dog reactivity uh, for, or for behavior modification. We have some books that are focused on um, particular um, behavior modification topics, so including like dog reactivity, for example. Um, and then we have a section of just good things to know. Um, some, some books that are very generally focused if you want to learn about um, how to, to work with animals, um, how dogs learn, and why, um, or how to appropriately apply positive reinforcement with your animal. 